Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers, we have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblood, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. On today's episode of Podcast for Inquiry, I speak with William B. Davis, best known for his recurring role as the cigarette smoking man in The X-Files. After decades of working as a theater director and actor in Canada, the UK, and the US, William B. Davis rose to prominence as the cigarette smoking man on TV's The X-Files. Besides appearing in numerous other TV shows and movies, most recently Upload and Midnight Club. Davis also founded his own acting school, the William Davis Center for Actor Study. Davis has written one other book, Where There's Smoke, The Musings of a Cigarette Smoking Man. He lives in Vancouver, BC with his wife, Emmanuel Davis. William and I start our conversation with how he began his life on the stage as a child actor and how that led to a lifetime career on the radio, on the stage, behind the scenes, and in front of the camera. He shares with us several tips, tricks, techniques, and traps for aspiring actors and what they can do and what they should avoid. We talk about his undergraduate university education in philosophy and how that led to him becoming a philosophical skeptic and how that informed his acting and directing subsequently. We talk about who his hero was and his reaction when his hero dunked on the X-Files. William shares with us some bonus material that did not make it into his book, but he wishes that it had. And finally, we end this episode with William sharing with us where he feels most comfortable and gets the most joy. Without further ado, I bring you my conversation with William B. Davis. William Davis, thank you for coming on Podcast for Inquiry today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about about your life and your work, but primarily I want to talk to you about your new book, which is called On Acting and Life. The first question I have for you, uh, when I was in grade eight, my drama teacher gave me a book by Laurence Olivier which was called On Acting. And I'm wondering if your title is a tribute to Olivier's semi-biography and advice for actors. Uh, Not at all, as it happens. If it's a tribute to anybody, it's a tribute to Stephen King, uh, from whom I uh, modeled the structure of my book, which is that it's a, a memoir for the first half and a distillation of knowledge in the second half, more or less, so that uh, King wrote a uh, biography of his work as a writer, of his career as a writer, and then in the second half, what he knows about writing. This is what I've done in this book. My first half is my my career, my life as an actor, acting teacher, director, but everything that in professional life I was exposed to about acting. And then the second half, distills what I think I know about acting. Um, Curious that you should say uh, Olivier's book, because I have read it recently. His book begins where my book ends. My book is all about process, how you work, what an actor does, what they bring to the work, what their preparation is. Olivier's book is all about what does he do on stage? How does he manipulate the audience? What does he want the audience to think? Um, things that, for me, are just automatic. You you got into acting almost through random chance, and it was not something that you had at least initially sought out. Can you tell us a little bit about how you your first exposure to acting and and how you and how you got started on on the path that ended sure. up defining most of your life? <laughs> uh, as it happened. I had a, uh, I had second cousins who were a half generation older than I, 
and they ran a summer theater company in Ontario. And my family lived in Toronto. And they needed a place to rehearse their plays in the city before they went north in the summer. And as it happens, they rehearsed in our basement. So I grew up, if you like, or at least when I was 10, 11, 12, with the theater company rehearsing in our basement and trying to explain to the neighbors why there was so much yelling and screaming going on in our house. But at a certain point, they needed a boy. They were doing a play called Portrait in Black, and they needed a a boy of my age, 11, whatever it was. And I was handy. I was convenient. So they said, hey, can you do this? I said, sure. So uh, (laughs) I did this piece with them in that summer and uh, got interested. And uh, from there, I got an acting teacher. And from the acting teacher, I got an audition with CBC Radio. And that's where actors worked in 1949 in Canada, was in radio drama. And I started to work as a radio actor, as a, as a boy. So you went from the stage to the radio, and then and then you went to um, uh, sort of backstage, and you you built you built props and were a stage manager. You did you did kind of everything related to the the, the theater, and that and then and then went on to directing. Uh, do you think that your career benefited for, benefited from you? having a very broad range of experience on essentially every aspect of what goes on in on, on the stage. Um, for sure, because uh, uh, it's a small world, or, and it was even smaller then. And so to, to, to work in the field when the more one knew, the more one had done, the better. And eventually to make a living, one had to actually run a theater company. And so to run a theater company, it helped to have done everything in the theater. theater. So you knew what was going on. You knew who had to do what and why and how. Um, so, so yes, it all contributed to a complete, uh, a complete exposure to the, to the craft. When you went to university, you, you majored in philosophy and, and got a degree in philosophy. I, I'm curious, uh, what elements of philosophy did you study, and how has that informed your your work as a director, and then subsequently as an actor? Oh my my my! my. Um, yeah, I mean, it, um, the the further explanation of of why I did that was that there were no acting schools in Canada. There was a wonderful extracurricular program at the University of Toronto, so one did that and then studied what one wanted to study. Um, Philosophy in U of T at that time was very much the history of philosophy. I mean, so you went through the Greeks, then you went through the Enlightenment, and and you know we had we had a wonderful instructor who started to go off with uh, uh, with Descartes and convinced you that everything that Descartes said was correct, and so you were then Cartesian, and then next week he would he would convince you that everything John Locke said was correct, and then you'd be a Lockean, and then he would hit Berkeley, and then you'd be convinced that Berkeley. And finally, you realized that uh, it was not so easy to see who was actually right. It, it all sounds so good when presented by an advocate and someone knowledgeable in each tradition. But it taught us how to think analytically and how to really analyze. Um, uh, so so as, a, as a method of thought, uh, I think is what I really gained from, from a f- philosophy degree. We didn't talk then much about the scientific method as we do now but still those those skills to to penetrate an argument to discover um, what holds up and what doesn't hold up and to just want to explore what uh, what the world is that we live in and um, transferring to acting it's always been what's interested me about the theater is and acting and and the profession is why do people do what we do? Whether we're talking about the actor himself or whether we're talking about the characters that we play, why do people behave the way they behave? Why do we do what we do? Um, so philosophy, I guess, launched me into that exploration. Um, it's influenced me in other ways too, because 
Uh, again, although it's a term I didn't use at the time, I guess I was a skeptic. Um, I was a, I was a, a brooding atheist, uh, even in high school, and shocking my Christian compatriots because they didn't, they didn't stand up for uh, or the, for Christianity, and I was in doubt about all of that. So when I came to think about how does an actor work, what does an actor do, one of the things I didn't think they did was want to find the soul of a character from the soul of themselves as an actor. Um, that they didn't want to dichotomize uh, the human being into mind and body, spirit and spirit and, and corporal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I wanted to see the human person as whole, as a totality, as an organism, I suppose as a product of evolution, which became more clear later to me. No, I should not say a product of evolution because I was just reading that in my book. Because when you say product of evolution, it suggests that evolution led us towards some culmination, some achievement, some success. Uh, evolution is just where we are now. <laughs> right. We, we, are, we are a work in progress. <laughs> exactly. We're continuing work. I don't even know if progress is the right word, but yeah. This is an expression that I love that uh, a, a work of art is never completed, yeah. only abandoned. <laughs> Eventually you have to publish or, or, or you, have to, you have to put it out there uh, for various reasons, but uh, the creators are never, are never done with it, at least in, in their own minds. I got a letter about my book. It was, as soon as it was out, I thought, God, I should have said that. No, I could have. No, I could have. You know. Well, then, all right. Well, here's, here's your opportunity, William. What, tell us one of those things, because I'm sure that everyone is going to run out and read your book after listening to this. Uh, but there's going to be, there's, there's, there's more things that you wanted to say. So tell us, what, what was one of those inspirations that you had that you should have included in the book that wasn't in there? There's a series of uh, what I call tricks, traps, and techniques in the book. And, right. Uh, mistakes, I suppose, that people make. And, and one of them that I didn't really spell out in the book is what I would call acting the role twice. Because mm -hmm. I saw someone do that quite recently after I read the book. Uh, she was playing a rather um, naive character, a rather somewhat um, excitable and whatever. Um, and she had all the actions within the play to do that. And that's all she needed to do. But she, either for her own um, thought about it or whether the director pushed her in this way, felt she needed to show that she was doing that. So she layered on a kind of ditzy performance on top of the ditzy ac actions. So we got double dits. <laughs> mm. uh, so, so then it was even harder to hear, harder to follow, harder to carry, care about, and was harder work for her. Um, so it, it's, it's a fault to play the character twice. To um, Another example might be, so I'm, let's take the cigarette smoking man. If I want to be play him twice, then I have to show you that I'm very evil and I want to do bad things in the world instead of just doing bad things in the world. So that brings me to one of the, I think it's, this is one of those uh, uh, tips, tricks and traps that you mentioned. And uh, you came down pretty hard on what you called indicating in the yeah. book versus yeah. acting. And yeah. so I was I was hoping that you could tell me like what is indicating and how is it different than acting and why is indicating bad? <laughs> well, indicating is and there's different ways you come at it, but it's it's showing the audience um what you think they should know about me the character in terms of what I'm feeling, who I am. Um and in life, people don't do that. People don't, you know, a proud person doesn't come and show you I'm proud. Look at me. I'm a proud person. They just come and boast. Uh, they do an action uh, uh, that we look at and say, that person is proud. Well, another way of putting it is, is 
um, character is character or characterization is really in the eye of the beholder. It's not in the person. We watch someone do different things, behave in different ways, and we conclude they're a different kind of person. But as an actor, then if we look at the character, we see, oh, he's that kind of person, she's that kind of person. So we think we have to present that person. We have to show that person. What we really have to do is just do what the character does, and that will show that person. So it, indicating why is it bad, it's indicating because it's false. It's not how people behave. You're, it's, you're not, the audience is not going to see a real person doing real things. They're going to see an actor presenting somebody, showing something. And, and that's not going to draw, draw the person in. It's not going to be interesting. It's not going to be alive. Uh, it's not going to be dynamic. So, so you, if someone is just presenting with artifice, there's not going to be an emotional connection, and therefore uh, there's, not, there's not the drama there? Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's a way to put it, yep. Yeah. So is, is that related to, or is that different than, because you, you also talk about in your book uh, the, the difference between surface technique and the substance of acting. And, it, and is, that, is, is, is that similar, or, or is, that, um, is, is there something more to the substance of acting than just... There's a nuance to that, because you may not be indicating when you're surface acting. You, okay. Uh, then then can, you define, can you define surface and substantive acting yeah, and, and, and the differences sure. between the two? Um, I mean, so I'm doing this play now, uh, working on uh, No Man's Land, you know, and we start off doing a reading of the play. And I'm a good reader, and I know how things should sound, and it's well written. So I can make it sound pretty darn good on the first reading. Uh, but that's the surface. Uh, and, 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 and if we don't do any more, that's all you're going to get. <laughs> and it may not even hold up. And it may not even be right. It may be wrong. But it will sound good. So as an actor, I basically have to let all that go and go and look underneath. Underneath may not even be the best word, but look at, at what's there. What is it that I do? What does I do? Why do I say what I say? Why am I doing this? And trying to connect myself to those specific actions, not the sound of the words as they roll out of my cho acting chops, as it were, but how do they come from me in a, in a living situation? Um, and, and then that builds a base. And it's a way of working that, that leads to growth in the work. I mean, especially if you think of theater, I've seen so often I have seen a wonderful first reading of a role, and then it gradually, through rehearsal and performance, it deteriorates. Isn't that like the, the purpose of, of rehearsal to just the opposite? <laughs> exactly. But it's because they started at the surface and tried to stay on the surface. Um, <laughs> but if they, if they do the opposite, which is to come in underneath and build a foundation, then you see it grow and grow and grow and it can, in a long run, it can keep growing and getting more strong and more dynamic. So is that like, I, you, you, you can do a good reading, makes it sound wonderful, but you, you just want to keep it so you don't experiment and, and, and explore and try and find, like yeah. the, the chances that someone's going to get something as, as rich and complex as a play correct on a first reading are, are I would imagine, vanishingly low because yeah. you, you have, with, with every line, you have a choice of, Diction and 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 emphasis and emotional freight and and what you're bringing to the scene, and 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 every one of those is a choice. So there's enormous variation. That's why Shakespeare is still relevant hundreds of years later because people still find nuances and bring new things to it. So it, 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 are you saying you should come at it humbly, so that you're you're still experimenting and exploring in the rehearsal process, so that you find something better than your your first attempt. And better and deeper than the first attempt. Better yes. and deeper. Absolutely. And, you know, what I say in the book, one of the things that I, I find kind of, that I really don't, in the modern kind of way we work now, uh, it happens in theater and it happens in film, 
uh, that we have a reading and we invite the crew or we invite the designers and uh, various people to come and hear the play at the first reading. Mm -hmm. And I want to say to them, you know, we're not ready. You know, <laughs> I don't go to the designer's studio and say, show me the set. When they just got the script, they do some work first and then they show me something. Give us a chance to do some work and then we'll show you the play. Um, so it leads us to do what we're talking is to throw on a surface, to throw on something that's quite um, um, presentable, but it's just on the surface. We had a, <laughs> you know, I love doing Upload, this series that I'm doing, but we mm -hmm. pre-pandemic, we had this strange thing where we were asked to do a reading of the first few episodes, and they flew all the high, high upper ups in, in Amazon or producing it to come and hear this first reading. And we were lined up along a table and the Amazon people were on the other side of the table. So we couldn't even see the people we were talking to, the other characters, the other actors. Right. We looked up, we saw an Amazon um, vice president <laughs> staring back at us, which didn't really put us in the right mood. And, um, but we were supposed to make it sound good. So they were excited about uh, being on this show. All those things, uh, it's too bad. It's too, I know why they do them. But uh, I think as an actor, we have to kind of quickly forget that we did that and then uh, start doing our real work. Right. One of the things, I, I found myself nodding quite a bit with uh, what you were saying and, and what, well, sorry, with what you wrote in the book. Yeah. But there was one, uh, there was one thing that, that, that puzzled me uh, when you were talking, and you said, don't look for magic. And perhaps, like for me, when I'm thinking, I, I, whenever I've been on the stage, looking for magic is that that moment of of connection where the, the text and the emotional content and the interaction with my fellow actors is just it all congeals and fits together. And for me, that's the magical moment. But it seemed that, uh, and, and so that's always what I strove for when when I, whenever I've been on the stage, but. So when you say don't look for magic, were you defining it differently, or am I am I looking for the wrong things when I when 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 I do strive for that moment? No, no, you're you're absolutely right about that. I don't remember what the context was when I said magic, because um, yeah, there's there's that, there's that moment as an actor which is lovely, which is when it seems to play you. Everything's happening, and you're just going for the ride. I mean, yeah, coming out of you. Um, yeah, no, that's that's exhilarating, and it's it's real, and it's true, and it's 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 terrific. Um, I can't. I'd have to. Rem I, I don't remember the context where I used the phrase of "don't look for magic." Um, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't write down the page number. I just. Uh, <laughs> I just. I just lifted the quotation. It could. It could be because I. You know, I talk about trying to modernize the way we look at acting. That. That. Um, that there's a very kind of 20th century look at how humans behave or who, what humans are. And, and it sees us as two things. We have a spirit in a body. We have a soul. We have an essence, uh, uh, which um, I think is untrue. We don't have an essence, um, mm -hmm. but, but we thought we did. You know, we had a soul and a body and the soul goes to heaven and the body stays down. It's all those things. So. So if you think you have a special essence as a as a person, then you think the character has a special essence as a character. And so you have to get from your essence to their essence. And that's hard. But they don't you don't have to do that because neither of them exist. You, you just have to behave the way they behave. And it all comes together. Another thing that I, I'm not sure I quite understood in your book, so I, I'm really happy that I have the chance to ask you, yeah, yeah. is uh, in, in a few places, you distinguish between pace and speed. Uh, and I would really like to hear you expand on that and, and what the difference is, because it's quite clear that they're quite distinct in your mind. Big, it's a big trap. And I was very, I was quite young when I was first exposed to this idea. I was doing 
doing a play. My cousin Murray was actually directing it, and he gave this talk to the cast. We were doing uh, this Pinero as the schoolmistress, and and this distinguish between pace and speed, and that pace is the illusion of speed. So when you watch a well-paced drama, whether it's on stage and television and film are a little different because the editor can affect the pace, whereas in stage mm -hmm. you don't have that, that opportunity. But so it feels like it's moving really quickly to the audience. This is happening and that's happening and that's happening. Wow. And it's just lifting you and carrying you along. But what happens sometimes is that the actors go too fast. So you go this and I go that and I go that and I go that. And I, the audience, go, hmm, what, hmm? And, you know, my, my image for that is imagine a, a tennis, you're at center court of a tennis match and you watch the ball and you watch the ball and you watch the ball and they're hitting. But suppose it speeds up too much and the ball starts going like this. Well, you can't follow it anymore. You just glaze over. It's just balls going back and forth because you can't keep up. Um, and so when actors go too fast, you can't keep up. And, and so it becomes boring. And so, you know, this, this thing that act, uh, actors keep doing, this Italian rehearsal, where you, you rehearse with your lines at double speed to be sure you know them, has t two disadvantages. Uh, one, that you're likely to go on stage and go too fast, so the audience doesn't follow you. And you're also likely to go on automatic you haven't given yourself time to have the impulses for what you say, so your 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 surface back to surface your surface again. You've gone up to the surface. All you're doing is is reciting words and not reacting to the actions and choices made by the other people in in your scene. Yeah, right. There's a lot of people that you mentioned, some very famous in in your book, uh, that you've had the pleasure of of working with, and you've you mentioned in a couple different areas that certain individuals have a spark just like immense raw talent including Do Donald Sutherland and Colm Fiore and they went on to to huge success what i'm curious about because you don't mention it in, in your book is did that instinct ever mislead you and and what i mean by that is did you ever believe someone had immense talent uh, and thought thought that they would uh, make it big, but they didn't, or someone that you thought was just a just a hack no, who no, nonetheless has remind me I've been wrong has become before. a star. <laughs> um, absolutely, yeah, no. Um, uh, the, the one that really embarrassed me was Brenda Donahue, who was an actor in Toronto, and she died regrettably in her thirties, but. Um, she was really a spark. I mean, everybody was excited about the work she was doing. And, and I was directing a play in Toronto. And, well, no, I was directing it in Quebec, but it, I was in Toronto casting. And so I brought her in, even though she was really too young for the part, but she was so good. I wanted to hear her in this role. And she said, you know, we've met before. I said, oh, I don't remember. And she said, yes, you rejected me for the National Theatre School twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't see that spark <laughs> when she came to audition because I was the artistic director at the school and I was responsible for who got in and who didn't. And I didn't let her in. I didn't think she had the spark. And then sure enough, she sure did. And then I'd, I'd let uh, there were other people that I let in. I thought they were they were going to be great and they weren't. So. Yeah, this is this is my my last my last question on on acting, and we'll get on uh, on that section of the book. We'll, we'll move on to, to other things in a moment, but I want I want to know, like you've lived a life steeped in particularly Canadian, but uh, but in in the stage and in TV dramas. What I'd like to know is, uh, what books and recorded performances, in your opinion, have really withstood the test of time that you would recommend to. Uh, people much younger than yourself today. I mean, apart from my own books, obviously. Uh, well, we can absolutely include both uh, of your books. <laughs> yes. 
I'm, I'm being a little ironic because obviously it's worth reading Stanislavski and it's worth, you know, reading the giants of the, uh, right. and it's worth reading, uh, um, Kazan and Clerman and, um, but you have to read them in context, you know, in the context of the early 20th century and, and what the kind of assumptions were at that time, what the theater was like at that time, what actors needed to do at that time, because that's changed a lot. Um, actors in the, in the 19th century or in the 20th century, well, in the 19th century, had to play in huge theaters and had to really expand. Right, and, and there were no microphones, so their voices no. had to fill the room on their own. And and what people were interested in, this is where Olivier comes in at the end of that, what people really wanted to see when they went to the theater was an actor acting. It's like going to the opera. You want to hear a singer singing. You didn't go for the story. You went to see the performance. And, and even uh, some audiences would just go to their to the lounge and tell the usher, to invite them in when the good parts were coming and they would come and watch um, the, the famous actor do their their big scene and then they'd leave again. I mean, now we watch streaming television in which we feel as if we're watching real life right in front of us. And, and so an actor has a different requirement. <laughs> uh, they don't need the range. Actors don't need to go into a theater company very often now and play a whole range of parts as we did when I was when I was starting. You had to play a twenty-year-old this week and a sixty-year-old the next week, you know, and you had to play a range of characters. Now you're likely to be cast within your physical um, frame of reference, within your um, tonal frame of reference, even, but you need to be very true and very natural and very committed within that okay <laughs> but still read the giants anyway so it's interesting you you need to not just look at how um how people honestly feel and react to be an actor but you need to be kind of in tune with the uh the fashion of audience expectations like if you if you take that if you take you know what is expected of an actor today and put them back in time a uh, hundred years or 150 years they would they they would fail miserably at it, and if you take probably what you're what we're advi what you're advising to people today, and push forward fifty or a hundred years, they might 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 be out of fashion among audiences at that time too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. I, I want to um, talk a little bit about the evolution of of your character on on the X Files. I, I I watched the the pilot recently, and you were. Uh, uh, a fairly intimidating presence, but you had you had absolutely no lines, and there was no indication in that episode that uh, you were going to be the I think the, the most recurring character within the series, aside, of course, from the two uh, the two stars. Why were you chosen to be the power be behind the throne, as it were, rather than any of the several other characters who were introduced at the time? You, well, you asked me a question I can't really answer, and I don't think they can either, because there was no plan. Oh, the, the the show had no bible in the sense that many shows do now, where different mm -hmm. uh, plot lines are filled out in advance and different characters fill it. Didn't have any of that. They just had some ideas out of Chris Carter's head and and then out of uh, Morgan and Wong's heads, and they weren't the same heads even. They didn't even. You wonder even if they ever talked to each other because some of their ideas were so different and varied. And so when they put me in the, in the pilot, I don't think they had any plan at all. And then um, they called me back partway through, well, well into the first season for a, a little bit. And I did a little bit more and smoked a little bit more. And <laughs> then they put me in the last episode and I did a few more things and people started to get interested in who is this guy, you know, um, fans got interested in who is this guy. Um, and then Morgan and Wong wrote this episode called One Breath in the second season in which there was a major confrontational scene between Mulder and the smoking man. And uh, 
I, I know uh, Bob Goodwin talks about this. It was one of the producers because he had to direct the episode. He had no idea if I could act or not. He didn't know anything about me. Uh, <laughs> He didn't even have time to look at my demo reel. He just had the hope <laughs> that it was going to be okay. Um, and of course it was okay. They were delighted. And uh, so then uh, they started to want to have more of me. And then Scully um, got pregnant and upset the whole plan. So because, uh, because she was pregnant, she couldn't be in certain episodes and what was going on. So then developed this whole storyline of the aliens abducting and implanting and blah, 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 blah. And then, and then came the storyline of the cigarette smoking man being the orchestrator of that on the, on the, in the human world, et cetera, et cetera. And the story developed, but uh, none of that was planned in advance. So that whole arc was essentially improvised or, or went, made up as they went along. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, I've always thought that actors relished playing villains they get to chew the scenery and have uh have a great time at it but at least at least in your book and from my impression from watching you on the screen you, you take almost the opposite approach uh, you write you must see the world as the character sees it judging judging your character is the kiss of death and in another place you wrote that the cigarette smoking man was doing what had to be done and fox Mulder was the true villain of the X-Files. So even though, you know, to, from an audience perspective, you were the ultimate bad guy, you were the face of the grand conspiracy that was the you know, connective tissue throughout the entire series, even though that was largely illusory, I just as I just learned. But in, you turned him into the hero, at least in your own mind. I'd love to hear more about why you made that choice and, and what, what that brought to your performance. Oh, there's, there's lots of levels to that. Um, there was a debate I had to do at, at the University of Toronto. They had a debating society and, mm -hmm. and they had this topic resolved that Faubus was right. Now, Faubus was the governor of Arkansas who stood on the steps and refused to allow the integration of, of, of blacks into the school system. So to anybody in Canada, he was the ultimate villain. Um, so they they so they when they have a debate they have the government proposition and the opposition proposition. The government proposition was resolved that Faubus was right. They couldn't find anybody to take it. They couldn't <laughs> find anybody <laughs> to take that side of the debate. And they finally arrived at me. And I thought, well, what the other side's too easy. <laughs> this side's fun. Let me try. <laughs> so so I had to debate that Faubus was right. Do you remember Stephen Lewis? Are you Ontario enough to yes. know Stephen Lewis? Yes, he, uh, he was Ontario politician. He was, uh, I believe, an ambassador to the UN for a while. Exactly. And, and he was in the audience on the other side. And you <laughs> should have heard him lay into me. <laughs> I mean, he became a friend. We, we knew each other well. But... Um, but I had to try to see how this man's mind worked and why it seemed to him that he was doing the right thing. And, and so within his given circumstances, he was doing what had to be done. And, and th that, I mean, obviously I didn't convince anybody at the University of Toronto that he was a good person, but, but it gave me a case. Um, Later, I played, uh, one of the first things I played when I was in rep was playing Don John in Much Ado About Nothing, and he's the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And again, I had to see the story from his point of view. Um, so, and then later I directed uh, a play where the actor convinced him, me, I, I thought he should play a villain, and he convinced me he had to play the right person, a man for all seasons, and he played Cromwell. And uh, he convinced himself that Cromwell was right and he's supposed to be the villain. And the play became so much more dynamic because they, each side believed in themselves. Um, so coming back to the, to the smoking man, I, you have to, I mean, I don't think Hitler believed he was a villain. I don't think Mussolini believed he was a villain. I'm sure Putin doesn't think he's a villain. Um, 
they think they're doing what needs to be done. Um, and that's the only way you can play them. I mean, if you try to play the bad guy, talk about indicating, talk about certain, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I am going to eat you alive. Um, it's not going to be very convincing. I mean, it might be fine for a pantomime or, you know, some exaggerated story, but uh, for anything that's supposed to be believable, yeah, you have to, you have to believe in what you do. Even, even when you're, even if you know you're at some level wrong, you somehow have to do it. It, uh, the parallel we used to make with the smoking man was the Vichy government in France and Pétain and, and who made a deal with the Germans to protect some of France. But then the Germans kept making it worse and he had to compromise more and more. So my thought with smoking man is, if I make this deal with the aliens, I can save some humans. Some of it will survive. But the aliens kept tightening the screws and demanding more. And by then you're so far into it, you can't get out of it. And, you're just, and all you can do is smoke to deny your feelings. But, and there's the sunk cost fallacy where I, you're, exactly. you've already gone so far down this road, it's too late to turn back. You you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the, the strand of philosophy that... Uh, you enjoy is skepticism and that, that, that you were a kind of a brooding atheist and the uh, tagline of the X-Files is pretty much antithetical to the skeptical perspective. Like I want to believe is, is, yeah. is the exact antithesis of, right. of, of the skeptic credo, which is essentially prove it. Like you can say whatever you want, but, but prove it. And I wonder if, uh, there was any cognitive dis dissonance for you being the 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 man who made the deal with the aliens and and uh, uh, and, and essentially popularizing or, or contributing to the enormous popularity of a show that is exemplifying something that is so contrary to your your personal beliefs and, and worldview. I think it was in 1996 that Richard Dawkins made his great speech to the, the Dimbleby lecture about how dreadful X-Files was, how it was promoting pseudoscience and it was really a bad thing. Um, Dawkins had been my hero ever since I read The Selfish Gene 10 years before that or 20 years before that. And here is my hero saying the show that I am doing is contributing to exactly as you say to pseudoscience and undermining everything I really believe. So I was caught, you know, my first thought was, I suppose I should quit. I suppose I should give up my acting career and say, yes, he's right. We should sh close this thing down. So this may have just been, you know, they say, they say people who are smart are good at defending ideas that they developed for unsmart reasons. Um, but I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Dawkins, you make this case. And it's true that what his point was that every time on every episode, some issue comes up in which there's a, a scientific valid reason to believe it, which Scully holds and a pseudoscience reason, which Mulder holes and Mulder's always right. Yeah, in that way, it's kind of the anti Scooby Doo. Exactly. So, but did this influence people to believe in pseudoscience? He did. He did, had no idea. He just said it did. He had no data. He had no evidence. He had not tested his hypothesis. <laughs> and frankly, I had. Not very well, not very crucially, but at, at the conventions of X File fans, I would, I would ask them, you know, how many of you believe that there are aliens among us? How many of you believe that aliens are abducting humans? Maybe fifty percent, forty percent, which was about the same as the average population in polls. So this group of dedicated X File fans 
showed no more evidence of believing in pseudoscience than the general population. So Dawkins had not proved his point. So I stayed in the I stayed in the show, had a happy time for another, another many years. That's a wonderful answer because when I when I thought of asking you that question, I was going to uh, to, to buttress it by saying that the Simpsons with uh, with Homer Simpson working at a nuclear plant and being completely incompetent at everything that he does, including his job. Uh, has contributed to anti-nuclear sentiment in the United States and the world. But I looked it up because I, I, that was just an idea that I had. Yeah. And there was absolutely no evidence that The Simpsons has contributed to anti-nuclear sentiment, that yeah. everyone knows he's a bumbling fool and that The Simpsons is a cartoon, literally, and, and a comedy. And so even though it portrays nuclear energy in, in a very negative light, Nuclear operators are not Mr. Burns, and, <laughs> and the folks behind the consoles are not Homer Simpson. And so yeah. you can be pro or against nuclear energy, but the Simpsons has no impact on that. And there are many, many, many skeptics, I discovered too, who were fans of the X-Files. Well, because it was good entertainment. Yeah. You don't have to believe in aliens or abductions or the paranormal to to yeah. watch. I mean, to, to watch any the Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or superhero movies or the X-Files. There were there were a couple of places where where Dawkins might have been right, but that's not what he he didn't zero in on the right ones. because uh, he was talking about the propositions at the beginning of an episode. But I remember there was one, I can't remember what the issue was. Um, but it had to be resolved. Uh, and it was resolved by past life regression. As if this wasn't a debated point, like an X-File. This was just assumed that past life regression is valid and it's a good way to test something. And that, I'd have to say, I didn't want to stand behind. So you have been a, uh, you've had a full career. You've been a, a stage director. Now you've had nearly 30 years as recurring roles in beloved TV shows. Where are you most comfortable as an actor in front of the camera or guiding the action in the theater from behind the scenes or, or, or somewhere else? Where, where do you derive uh, the most pleasure, the most joy? Where are you most comfortable? I'm probably the most comfortable standing in front of actors in a rehearsal hall as the director. Um, I mean, that's pretty much where I, I mean, I literally began as a boy actor, but but by the time I was 20, I was a director in my own mind. And I was trained as an actor in order to know more about directing, basically. Um, so I still hark back to, to that, I suppose. And, uh, and I have skills there that people have forgotten about. People don't even know now that it makes a difference how you place people on a stage, um, it seems. So that's probably where I'm the most comfortable, but it's also also because I have the most control. Um, and as an actor, you you have less control and you don't know what, what kind of director you have or what kind of role you have. And, and also as an actor, especially in film and TV, you spend a lot of time waiting while they set up the scene, while they light, da, 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 da. As a theater director, you, you walk in, you work all day and then you leave. Um, even a film director waits a lot, but a stage director is always working. Um, so if I have to answer the question, that's what I would say. But uh, I like doing all of them, and they all have their different rewards. You know. When I was when I was quite young, I I loved the stage, and throughout uh, most of my teens, my 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 goal was to become an actor. But by the time I hit university, I. I made different choices. Drama was my minor in, as an undergraduate degree, but uh, I decided not to make it my major. Right. You've had a lifetime uh, working in and around the stage and on TV. What advice would you have or what insights would you like to share for, for young aspiring actors that uh, uh, if, if you could talk to me 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, do you have any advice for people that, that dream of a life uh, on the stage or on the screen or, or behind the camera or, be, or, or in the wings? Well, those are different things. Uh, um, on, the, on the production side, uh, I think the career path is, is relatively different. I mean, there's training you get and then you apprentice 
and then you work. It's there's a kind of logic to being a, a, a craft. And is that true for is that true for for like the create like the directors as well, or, or or is that more for like the electricians and the set builders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinking about the electricians and the and the carpenters and, and whatever. It's not that different, I don't think, from being an electrician in house building, you know, you, you're still an electrician, but a director's is, is different, uh, is more challenging. Um, what I would say to the actor is uh, first get good training. Um, don't think it's, uh, don't think it's a, as many do that it's some natural thing that I'm just going to do a, one class in introduction to acting, another class in audition, and then I'll go work as an actor. Um, you might, you might be lucky, but better you should learn your skills, better you should learn how to do it. And then what I think is important is that you really want to do it. You really like to do it. If you're dreaming of fame, I don't know, go on TikTok. Um, it's not, you might become famous, you might, but you might not mm -hmm. um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, some of which might be your basic talent level, but uh, many of them have to just do with luck and chance. Um, but if you really like to act, there's acting you can do all your life. You may not make your living at it. It may be a supplement to your living, but you can act. Um, so if you want to do that, if you want to act, go for it. If you want to be famous, eh, think about it carefully. <laughs> no. I mean, if you've got, you know, if, if you look wonderful, you're beautifully handsome, beautifully beautiful woman, and you have a great voice uh, just naturally, and you move fluently uh, just naturally, um, yeah, yeah. Get some classes and go to work. But you could be a character actor too. I mean, this uh, it's all very difficult. It's all very difficult. You never know. They used to say uh, that an actor has their right casting age, so that you know some actors are are really right when they're in their early twenties. Some actors aren't really right until they're in their fifties in terms of what their personality and what their physical type brings to the to the craft we've, we've been talking for about an hour now if people can read your book uh on acting and life by by william davis you can be found uh on amazon prime i believe in the tv show upload what's next for you season three of upload actually is what's probably next i think we're going to be shooting that this summer it's not absolutely firm but it's what they expect. Um, and so my David Choke character based on the Koch brothers is going to be doing other stupid things, I think. Um, I'm working on No Man's Land as a play, uh, which we're going to do uh, late November, December in Vancouver. Um, and vaguely, people ask me, what am I going to write next? Because I hadn't really thought of myself as a writer particularly. I had, I was a theater person with some things to write about. But now I'm thinking about writing a book on the history of skiing. Really? <laughs> well, I've realized, you know, there, there's been articles about the history of skiing in various places. And I realize I know, I know so much about it because I started so young. You know, I know when there were three chairlifts in Canada. That's when I learned to ski. There were three chairlifts and one of them was broken. Uh, so there were actually only two operating for the entire season. When we went up lifts on, on a rope toe, pulling us up when, when Collingwood had nine rope toes and we thought that was fantastic. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know. It's just, a, it's just a whim of an idea, but, uh, but I might have a go at it. Well, I look forward to that. William Davis, thank you so much for taking the time with me today. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. I encourage everyone to look up uh, on acting and life. Uh, any any last thoughts before before we go? Well, just to just the pleasure of sharing 
you know, what I've been doing with my life with, with many people and, and hope that you enjoy experiencing that with me and, and can benefit from something that I, things that I can leave with you. Thank you again. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and engage in the conversation. Comment, rate, and review. Email us at podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Center for Inquiry Canada. We rely entirely on donations to be your voice supporting science, free inquiry, critical thinking, and secularism here in Canada. To our supporters, thank you. If you have not yet contributed, please consider making a donation today at centerforinquiry.ca slash donate or becoming a member for only $30 per year at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. Your contribution supports our efforts to have reason and evidence drive decision-making everywhere. CFIC is on the web at centerforinquiry.ca. We are on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Matt Payne, Nikolay Nikitushkin, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt. See you next time.